Welcome to Out of the Fold. This episode is the first part of two of my conversation with YouTuber Apostate Prophet. He makes videos about Islam from his perspective as an ex-Muslim, many of which have an upbeat tone or generally poke fun at Islam. As a staunch supporter of both free speech and comedy, I love it. Probably because I believe that the only things worth taking seriously are those which hold up under ridicule, and that no institution, even religious ones, and the prophets or gods, are exempt. He talks very seriously, as well, about his personal experiences with Islam and the empathy and admiration he has for ex-Muslims and Muslims who are questioning their faith in Muslim-majority countries and conservative Muslim families where they may be at risk. His content has attracted many users who aim to discredit him, many of whom use arguments that not all Muslims are fundamentalists, some of the holy teachings are more about the culture of their time than they are about holy law, that he is just lying about Islam, and that one can't take issue with Islamic holy teachings without also denouncing some similar Christian or Western practices. We address some of these in our conversation, and I encourage you to watch Apostate Prophet's videos and fact-check him and his sources, then come to a conclusion on your own. A link to his YouTube channel is in the description. On January 31st, Apostate Prophet got permanently suspended from Twitter for what they called hate speech. On Twitter, He often points out Islamic ironies and speaks out against Islamic teachings promoting execution of apostates and violence unequivocally directed towards women, often by quoting verses in Muslim holy books and public figures who profess them as just. It makes me curious about the limits of what Twitter is okay with its users saying as long as it's in the name of a recognized religion, and why ex-Christians are allowed to criticize Christianity so freely on its platform. We recorded this conversation a few weeks before his ban. If you agree with his stances, or at least his right to speak them, please join those of us who have been petitioning Twitter to restore his account. Though religious organizations, companies, or individuals were contacted for comment about any of the content of this episode, the views expressed are strictly those of the ones expressing them. Our conversation began on a Wednesday evening. I was born in Germany into a Turkish Muslim family, so uh, it it was also a very religious family. Um, So the standard is that if if you grow up into such a family, into a a family that is in a European country, in in a non-Muslim country, and that is also very religious, it's the standard that that you're... Uh, that your parents keep you away from certain things that you see outside in that country and try to raise you in the most religious way possible in the way they think it, uh, they think it's, it is right to raise you. So uh, naturally, I was subject to many restrictions in Germany in my uh, at home, you know. Uh, I, I was subject to, to many restrictions, many things that I wasn't allowed to do outside at all, many things that I was uh, very often warned about. I was uh, very often forced to attend specific uh, practices, specific things that my parents would like to attend because of their religiousness. I wasn't ever, I believe, forced to pray which is uh, which I am lucky for. Mm-hmm. And my parents used to tell me very often to uh, please stop what, I, what I, stop doing whatever I'm doing and just uh, participate in the prayer, to keep praying, to pray at night, pray before I go to sleep, and so on. Uh, by praying, I mean the five daily prayers in Islam, uh, which go from the morning to the uh, to night. Uh, but yeah, I was I was raised under very religious circumstances, and I was, for example, never allowed to have a girlfriend, hmm. uh, even hanging out with girls uh, as friends from school was considered quite a bad thing. My parents warned me about that very much. It would, I mean, I would get in trouble for just having a girl's phone number on my phone, which is which is ridiculous because it was Germany, and hmm. and in Germany it's the most normal thing to just you know. 
regardless of gender, to just make friends, to call people, to go outside with everyone, to go swimming with everyone, and so on. But I wasn't even allowed to go to to go to swim with my friends. So. Um, yeah, I was subject to quite uh, to quite religious restrictions and obligations. I didn't always uh, obey. I didn't always observe those obligations and restrictions. Uh, for example, when I was an early teenager, I started drinking alcohol, which uh, in Germany, people start drinking alcohol at a, at a very young age. I mean, I started drinking when I was 12, 13 or so, uh, and pretty, pretty heavy stuff too. But... Um, yeah, I, I was I was trying to still live my own life as someone who was born in Germany. I, I recently talked about this on on Facebook and on a YouTube video, I believe. I, as someone who was born in Germany, I really liked German culture. I really liked the way uh, people lived in that country, how people thought, how people were uh, tolerant and respectful of each other which is something that I uh, didn't really see among my relatives, among my people, if you want to call it so, you know, uh, Muslims, immigrants, mm. whatever it is. Uh, I liked it very much. And ev even on even on uh, times like Christmas, for example, I wasn't allowed to participate in any form of Christian, in any form of Christmas celebration, which includes uh, giving gifts, taking gifts, uh, Santa Claus, this and that. But I would love to just sit down and listen to Christmas music because that's just something I grew up in and I have sympathy for it. I like it. But when I was 16 years old, I was forcibly taken to Turkey. My parents uh, wanted to move to Turkey. I had no choice in that. Uh, so I had to live in Turkey for 10 years, 11 years. I tried to really get used to it. I saw how, um, how Muslims really are among themselves. I never liked it. I hated it. I was in a complete identity crisis because I considered myself a German and I thought these were Turks and I just didn't like it. I tried really hard to, to adapt. I really tried very, very hard to assimilate but it never really worked you know mm -hmm. I was just so much um, I just had this I just had this bond to my origins to all the things that I liked about Germany about German culture about Christians and atheists and so on and in, in Turkey it was it was so much more about you know in, in Germany people don't even care about people used to not care about what anyone believes in or where anyone is from and as soon as I was in Turkey it was just wherever you are, people talk so much about about other people's religions. So much uh, they would be they would be so judgmental about other people. They would be even judgmental about me because I would be considered uh, a, a German Turk, and and that was even something bad in Turkey. Hmm. Later, I realized that uh, that in other Muslim cultures, I mean. Uh, Turkey is a very moderate Muslim country, as we call it. In other Muslim cultures, like Iraq, for example, I went to Iraq twice. I saw some different cultures. I saw, saw some different places, and I saw that uh, that it's all even much worse. But none of that stopped me from becoming very, very religious uh, in around 2010. Around that time, before the time, I believed in communism and all that nonsense because I was just a rebellious kid. <laughs> but mm. then at that time, I started becoming very religious. I started questioning the meaning of life and so on, uh, devoted myself very much to this religion. And I always had this spirit to study something and to learn something really, really well, to, to, to make my knowledge of a subject perfect before completely giving myself to it. Uh, and with Islam, I started studying it day and night. Once I start, once I decided to get a, to get a bit closer to it. So, uh, for about four years, I spent basically every day doing my daily stuff, like you know, going to school, working this that, but also at, uh, in the evenings, at night, reading endlessly about Islam, reading the Quran three times, which. Uh, the Quran is not something many people, many, many Muslims have properly read in their own language. Most Muslims haven't. Uh, I read the secondary sources, which is the Hadith, which is basically um, narrations, traditional narrations about uh, the Prophet Muhammad's life, about all the things he did. Mm -hmm. um, and so many other scholarly sources, interpretations of the Quran and so on. And 
I had a lot of questions during that time, even when I was very religious. I remember this one time when I was when it was uh, in the middle of summer and it was brutally hot outside. But I was just I just wanted to fast for days. Um, and and I, I was fasting. It had been a week into fasting, you know, voluntarily, not for Ramadan. Ramadan is the fasting month, but I was outside of that. Mm -hmm. But even at that time, when I was so devout, I had these big doubts about Islam. And uh, I explained on my on my YouTube channel in two or three YouTube videos how this whole process happened. Uh, I was basically trying to dismiss all the doubts that I had when I read the Quran, but they were challenging me so much and I couldn't find proper answers from anyone. I could just find excuses, you know, and uh, people trying to rationalize things, people trying to make mistakes look like they're not mistakes, but I wasn't satisfied with those things. And uh, all my doubts about the Quran's authenticity regarding its uh, words about about Earth and about all the objects around us, about the sky being an object, about the moon, uh, ab about the sun turning around the Earth, the moon being a light on, of its own and following the sun and so on. That all combined with my moral problems that I had with Islam anyway, led me to the conclusion after four years that uh, I'm not going to believe in that, in this religion anymore. Um, yeah, hmm. that's about what happens. <laughs> I remember, um, and you, you talked about it in one of your YouTube videos and it, and it kind of reminds me of, um, of what you were just talking about the, um, I don't know if it was a, a parable or if it was meant totally literally, but it was the idea of, um, the sun setting in a muddy spring. Um, and, and when I hear that kind of thing, I mean, it sounds like a metaphor. It sounds like a metaphor for, you know, the sun going down over the horizon. Um, but a lot of people who were raised Muslim, it seems like they're almost taught that that's literal. That's, you know, that's actually what happens. Well, the thing is, uh, now in our time, uh, people try to make that a metaphor, you know, faithful Muslims, moderate Muslims try to make that a metaphor, but it's not. The Quran literally says, I mean, it tells the story of a, of a guy called Dhulkarnain, which, uh, which translates to, uh, the man with two horns, which, according to some theories, refers to Alexander the Great, which is also a bit weird, because why is the Quran talking about Alexander the Great? Hmm. Uh, so w what some people think is that Muhammad was asked about some guy called Dhulkarnain. Muhammad didn't know who exactly that was, so he started making up a story about him. Uh, uh, of course, Muslims believe that it was a complete wisdom, but they can not in any way tell who that person is supposed to be. But uh, when the Quran tells that story, it says that this that this that this guy Dulkarnain was a very powerful guy who was, uh, you know, who who had the power of Allah bestowed on him. I mean, Allah was supporting him on Earth, and this and and Dulkarnain was very powerful, and he traveled to the to the furthest east and to the furthest west, which is something the Quran says, which also doesn't make sense if we look at the Earth to, in today's time. Um, but it says then that uh, that when Dulkarnain went to the furthest uh, west, he saw uh, the sun sinking in a muddy spring. That is, this is literally what the Quran says. It says he saw the Quran sinking in a muddy spring. I'm not very good with numbers, but I believe it was uh, chapter 18. Uh, I would like to look anyway. Anyway, so. Um, <laughs> In that, uh, in, in that, in that, in that narrative, in that narration, it, the Quran literally says that he saw the Quran sinking in a muddy spring. Now, that's of course something very problematic if you think about it uh, in today's time. You know, what is that supposed to mean? Uh, the thing is, the, the the modern Muslim apologist tries to say that this is only a metaphor, that we can observe the same thing when we go to the furthest west and look at the ocean, right. and it will look like the sun is sinking in something, you know, in something muddy in a spring or, or whatever it is. But that's not what the Quran says. The Quran literally says he saw it sinking in a muddy spring, and it talks about the furthest west, which is something that doesn't exist. The funny thing is. Even if we accepted this uh, apologetic by Muslims, further, the same uh, story also says that he went to the furthest east and he saw the sun 
he, he went to the rising place of the sun. It says he went to the rising place of the sun, which makes no sense. And when he went to the rising place of the sun, he saw it rising immediately on a people who didn't have any protection against the sun. So Dulkarnain went and built a wall for those people so they could protect themselves against the sun. Now, <laughs> it doesn't sound like a metaphor at all. Right. Yeah. Especially that part. I mean, the first part, okay, you could say, well, that's a metaphor. But if you go to the second part, how do you explain that? It doesn't make sense. Huh. <laughs> and are there a lot of stories like that in the Quran that sound like they're supposed to be metaphorical, but they're actually literal? Well, uh, there are some stories, not very significant ones with such obvious uh, scientific mistakes. But uh, the thing is, I made a very recent project in which uh, the project was a little bit more humorous, to be honest. I made a little bit uh, fun of the whole issue. I called it 43 scientific mistakes in the Quran. And just quickly went through a lot of ridiculously ridiculous sounding things in the Quran. Um, not in stories, but in very, very normal sentences in the Quran when the Almighty Allah explains things. You know, the Quran is supposed to be the direct spoken word of Allah. Um, when he explains things, he says things like that um, that the sky could fall down on the earth, but that Allah is holding up the sky. And it, make, it makes even a very ridiculous statement in which it says that, uh, in which it, uh, in which it considers it a remarkable thing that the sky is standing up there without any without any visible pillars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's literally what the Quran says. Hmm. I mean, who doesn't think that sounds ridiculous? <laughs> hmm. uh, it says things like that the, that the stars are little objects. This, it, it's literally what the Quran says, that the stars are little objects in the sky, in the nearest heaven, uh, that they are just there to beautify the, the sky, the heaven. And uh, it even says, it even goes on and says that, that they are, uh, small lights and much worse it also says that that those stars are also objects missiles that angels throw at evil spirits outside mm -hmm. the earth there is so much more you know there is like uh Basically, it implies that the Earth is flat, that the Sun is that uh, that the Sun is turning around us, that the Sun goes somewhere at night. In the narrations outside of the Quran, which is a secondary source and to some equal to the Quran, it says that the Sun goes uh, at night to a specific place where it prostrates under the throne of Allah and and asks for Allah's permission to rise again the next morning. You know, Muhammad wasn't aware that that the Sun is just continuously uh, that we are just turning around the sun and so on so it's 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 obvious with blatant scientific mistakes scientifically wrong statements uh some muslims even try to say well the quran is not a scientific document it's not a scientific paper it's a it's a book of science so why are you pointing these things out but that's not an excuse the quran is supposed to be the perfect uh direct spoken word of the almighty all-knowing god allah mm -hmm. uh, and if it makes such such obviously ridiculous uh, statements, such wrong statements, that there, then there is something wrong with it. Well, I think it would be one thing if everybody who believed it saw those things as metaphors and then also saw things like the morals of it as metaphors as well or as guidelines rather than mm -hmm. as fundamentals that you are required to live your life by. Mm -hmm. But instead, it's just like everything. It's, it's either everything or nothing. Yeah, the, the thing is, uh, in many of these things, you know, where the Quran, for example, describes the, the stars as little tiny lights or as missiles that are thrown at, at devils, there is not even any moral story in those statements. They are just normal statements about how beautiful everything is and how Allah made everything perfect. You know, there is no moral story, nothing about it. It's, it's, not, it's, not, just, it's not a metaphor at all in most cases. So, you know, uh, uh, you, you could excuse the first incident, you could uh, excuse the first example of the sun sinking in a muddy spring with that, uh, that there is probably something hidden in that and it's just metaphorical and so on. But uh, when we come to all these other examples about the sun and the stars and the sky and the winds and birds and so on, there is absolutely nothing behind those things. They are just uh, just regular statements made by the Quran to, uh, to explain how wonderful Allah is. Right, they're kind of empty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So when you were um, when you were in Germany, were you sort of in a pocket that had a lot of Muslims in it, or were you kind of part of a small community um, that was you know that 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 you know brought in a lot of Muslims to like a particular mosque or something? Like, how how did it work in that area? Well, um, my parents were part of a of a Sufi order. Um, Sufism is uh, mysticism in Islam. Uh, which is which is still clashing in the world occasionally with fundamentalist Muslims. Hmm. Uh, mysticists are also very religious people, also uh, in most of their practices and beliefs fundamentalist people, but they have these additional practices of revering uh, leaders, spiritual leaders, kind of like saints in Christianity, but even 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 more uh, even more I don't know spiritual. I would say uh, my parents were part of something like that. And uh, they would go to gatherings of such a Sufi order of such a mysticist order. And they would they used to bring me and my uh, my siblings to that as well. But I wasn't part of any of that until until I became a young adult in Turkey. So in, in Germany, I was just around with normal other immigrants. I would go to the Friday prayer to a normal, uh, regular mainstream Muslim church, uh, mosque. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That's so would did you, did you associate with, um, with other Muslims or have you gotten to know other Muslims in your life that, um, that your views differ significantly from? Uh, you know, you, you mean my my views at that time, or yeah, should, yeah. To clarify, yeah. So the views that you had at that time, you know, had, did you at that time know anybody whose Muslim, whose views about Islam were totally different, or have you met any Muslims since that you know you hear the way that they talk about the Quran and it's completely different from the way that that you that you were taught about it? Not completely different, I would say. I mean, um, I have met Muslims back then and uh, and and now as well that uh, believe in some different interpretations of the Quran. Uh, like there are there are some reformists uh, who reject all other narrations about Islam and about Muhammad, and who stick only to the Quran. And while doing that, also uh, interpret the Quran differently. I mean, I've I've met. Uh, a few people of that kind, and they, they are very different, but they are also a very, very tiny minority in the world among Muslims. Otherwise, um, I have met fundamentalist Muslims who uh, were a little bit different from me, and a li and also more moderate Muslims who would interpret the, the, the Quran in a bit more of a peaceful way. But um, the fundamentalist Muslims weren't weren't very, very different from. Uh, from my views in terms of how the Quran is interpreted. They were just uh, a bit more different in uh, in priorities and attention of matters within Islam. Uh, those people whom we call moderate Muslims, they were, I wouldn't even call them different. They are just usually less religious and less informed about about the faith. Hmm. You know, it's even something we talk about in the West where we say that there are also moderate Muslims. You know, there are radical Muslims, there are fundamentalist Muslims and uh, violent ones and this and that. But there are also moderate Muslims. That's not really something that represents the truth because a moderate Muslim is not really a thing. And uh, a regular Muslim would consider the term moderate Muslim insulting. They would consider that uh, offensive to themselves, to their identity, and to Islam, because uh, a regular Muslim doesn't accept accept such a such a definition of a Muslim, you know, as a moderate. Uh, and and um, by moderate, when we when we refer to moderate Muslims in the West, we actually uh, ignorantly refer to people who are not very well informed about Islam or who don't practice Islam very well. So so what what would be the right word for maybe somebody who really elevates the the things in the Quran that are about peace, but maybe doesn't pay as much attention to the things that are about, you know, punishment and, mm -hmm. and implementing Islam across the world? Well, I would I would ironically refer to them as a moderate Muslim anyway. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There is no proper word for that because it's just not something that is uh, that is a mainstream Muslim belief. That is a mainstream Muslim path. You know, um, in Islam, 
in, in Sunni Islam, for example, we have four uh, four schools, four branches, uh, which is the Hanafi, Hanbali, uh, Shafi, and Maliki. Uh, and, and these branches, all four of them are accepted by each one of them as true. Uh, they just they accept each other and they just uh, think they're going uh, different ways and have different pr priorities regarding different teachings. But um, the thing is that those four types of Muslims are also the only ones that are accepted by Sunni Muslims. And those are also probably uh, more than 80 percent of Muslims. The others 15% are probably Shia Muslims who also have their own branches that that, that accept each other. Mm -hmm. um, and and in all these branches, in, all, in these four branches of Sunni Islam and in these uh, three branches of Shia Islam, uh, everything is pretty much the same. There are no big different interpretations of the Quran. Um, outside of that, if someone comes and rejects things like killing apostates or uh, subjugating the non-believer, you know, uh, Islam being superior and so on, or rejecting the infidel and taxing them and so on. If someone comes and uh, rejects those things, such a person is simply not in line with Islam, is simply not in line with with the form of Islam that is globally accepted. You know, um, we see people, of course, in the West who think that... Uh, who say outside to people, to especially to more liber liberally oriented uh, people in the West, uh, they say to them that, that Islam is totally misunderstood, that, that Islam doesn't have those qualities of violence and subjugation and taxing the disbeliever and uh, killing the apostate and punishing the blasphemer and so on. Right. But those but those people are not those people are not accepted in any school of Islam at all. Those people are kind of a, kind of a reform. In themselves, mostly unbeknownst, you know, it's hmm. I don't know. It, it's it's a, it's a little bit of a tricky issue. It's something that's that's emerging now in these recent times. has has only been happening for the last decades. A hundred years ago, no one cared about apologizing to the world about how beautiful ex uh, and and misunderstood Islam actually is. That's something very very new. So um, there is no name for that, and I wouldn't have a name for that. Well, you're you're echoing something that that's really interesting. The time that I've been doing the show, um, every ex-Muslim that I've spoken with, and and a lot of people that I've gotten in touch with in the ex-Muslim community have really wanted me to try to understand that there is something unique about Islam that that promotes fundamentalism in a way that the other religions might not. Um, Absolutely. And what I guess what I mean by that, and what I'm starting to learn more from that, is you know when you look at Christianity. Jesus' whole message was that, you know, you, you, if you believe in Jesus, that you don't really need to worry that much about anything in the Old Testament. All that stuff is gone as long as you believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that was sort of a reform of Christianity or like, you know, almost like Jewish reform. And then like that, that ended up becoming Christianity in a way, like if you wanted to look at it like mm -hmm. that. But um, you just, you just said something that's, a, that's very similar to what I've heard. And what what is it in in um in the Quran that 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 makes it so that you know if you were to um you know just say that you you want to you know you you want to make it about love instead of fear you want to make it about tolerance instead of dehumanization that makes you not a real Muslim. Well. Um... It's it's a very very important point. It's a very interesting point that, that you're uh, that you're addressing. I would like to go very lengthily into this, but I don't know how much I can really talk about that. Uh, it's something that I address very often in my videos, in my own work as as well. When I say that Islam is not really uh, is not even a religion as we know it, you know. <clears throat> Uh, especially not compared to Christianity. People in the West assume that Islam is just another religion like Christianity, you know, that people have their own interpretations of and their own denominations and people just uh, want love and peace and accept each other. And of course, there will be some fights between denominations, but that's all to it and so on. But that's not really what Islam is. As you say, uh, in Christianity, Jesus was that figure who came, who spoke words, 
who said uh, forgive each other love each other uh, and this is what you should be doing you know forget about all those forget about punishing people and repressing people and repressing yourselves do this and this and that and you will be free you will be saved mm -hmm. uh, and Christians just followed that path and had their uh, of course early Christians especially under the Roman Empire set up their churches and set up their own standards of what this Christianity is supposed to be later we went through reforms uh, and in Christianity reform meant to go back to original Christianity right. to go back to the to the teachings of Jesus and mm -hmm. and and the apostles uh, now let's jump to Islam from there Islam is very very different uh, in Christianity you don't have a central human figure that uh, that everyone is supposed to follow you have Jesus but Jesus is God Jesus has uh, Jesus doesn't give you examples of how to brush your teeth or how to go to the toilet mm -hmm. or what to wear in the morning you know uh, or to eat figs or whatever <laughs> <laughs> you know Jesus teaches about morality in Islam there is a central figure inside this religion that everyone has to respect everyone uh, should love and no one can speak against if you speak against this figure Figure, you are basically committing blasphemy in Pakistan for example when people say that uh, that Muhammad was an, was an unimportant person that goes against the law because it is considered blasphemy so Islam unlike Christianity and even unlike Judaism has a complete new system in which it has a central human figure whose life is reported in thousands of narrations that we call hadith today right. which is a secondary source to the quran and in those narrations you can find everything from how he wiped his butt to uh to what he ate with which hand he ate uh what he exactly said when he went to the toilet or when he went to you know when he went out of the house or when he entered the house what he did with dogs and so on and muslims are really supposed to follow his teachings this is a form of worship. It's called uh, the Sunnah, the emulation of Muhammad's life. It's a form of worship, and it's 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 uh, it's considered practically obligatory in Islam to follow Muhammad, or at least not to contradict him, or at least not to speak against him. And uh, but most importantly, and that's the point I want to come to, uh, I usually say that Islam can't even be properly called a religion, let alone uh, an Abrahamic religion, because it is much more focused on uh, on the law set by a human and recorded in uh, narrations by humans than it is on worshipping God and uh, having good morals and hoping for salvation. Islam is a political system, not a religion. Hmm. In Islam, uh, you have exact specific laws on uh, on which person should be punished in what exact way. You know, a person who says this should be uh, should be punished in this way uh, on such an occasion in front of so many people and so on. Uh, saying these words is considered blasphemy. Saying these words is considered apostasy. And if uh, if after committing apostasy, this person says this, then he can be forgiven. And if he doesn't say this, if he says that, he will be killed, and so on. There are such specific laws under uh, under the respected. What do you call it in, in, in a dictatorship? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, under the respected high rule of Muhammad, the high ruler of Muhammad, uh -huh. you have these very, very specific laws under which Islamic war is practiced, Islamic law is practiced, Islamic private life is practiced, Islamic sex life is practiced, Islamic uh, toilet attitude is practiced, and so on. So it's... It's it's a big mess. The normal Western person doesn't understand this. They think it's just like Christianity. It's not. It's very different, and it has a very specific set of rules. Uh, something Muslims proudly say very often nowadays is, uh, you can see that online, and, and many people who are not familiar with Islam don't even understand what the point is when Muslims say that. But Muslims say, uh, the Quran is the, the Quran is the only book that has never been changed, or Islam is the only religion that has never been changed. No one can change Islam. No one can change the Quran. You know, when a Christian person hears this, or when an atheist or a Jew hears this, they think, uh, okay, so why are you bragging about that, you know? <laughs> but to the Muslim, to the Muslim, that is, that is like, that is taught to every Muslim from childhood. That's right. a matter of, that's a ma that that's of such great importance that this uh, religion has been supposedly preserved 
from Muhammad to our time with its exact laws and no one can change it. We have still to observe the law uh, today that was given uh, 1,400 years ago in Muhammad's time in which he said that women are stupid. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's incredible. I don't know. We can we can talk endlessly about this. I think I think you get the point. <laughs> well, so I I got bold enough to ask this question in the ex-Muslim subreddit because that's actually been a great source for me to 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 find out about this because you know I I had that same view that a lot of people do. So I, I was I was raised to be on the on the left side politically, and I mean I still would say that I'm 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 in the middle, but like I'm I'm definitely more towards the left because I I really value human rights. So I mean mm -hmm. I I was always taught you know, that we need to treat each other equally and we need to value everybody's opinion. But in the time that I've been doing this show, I've I've heard this perspective that it's like, you know, we don't, we sh really shouldn't be doing things like putting the, 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 um, the face veil, the hijab up on a pedestal. Like we shouldn't be using that as a symbol for feminism because mm -hmm. that's actually been something that's historically been used to take away rights for, for feminists, uh, for, for women. Um, but in, in the West, you're right. I mean, we, we use it as a way and we, we prop it up and we say that if you are against women wearing the hijab, then you're actually anti, you're anti-feminist, you're anti-woman. And it's, it's completely wrong for anybody who's been, um, that's been dehumanized or has, or has had Islam used against them, um, in those countries or by their families. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, the hijab is a very good point. I mean, uh, I have seen many. I have seen many people in Turkey and uh, I don't know in Germany and in, in many other places, uh, women that wore the hijab but didn't really want to wear the hijab. Exactly. But but uh, they put it on once in their lives, and then they were they were they were never able to take it off again. They were either um, you know forced by their parents. And by forced, I don't mean they were uh, beaten into that. They were forced as in uh, you wear this or you will leave this house or you wear this or you will never call me dad again or you wear this or I will disown you, mm -hmm. you know, in, in such ways. I've met so many women. I, I met this, uh, this, this one girl who was uh, wearing the hijab and uh, she once cried. When she explained to me how she wasn't even how she didn't even want to wear this and how she, how she was so much more interested in just living her life and having 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 boyfriends and this and that you know but she was practically forced to wear the hijab and she would never be able to take it off again and she even said to me that uh that it's over for her because uh at that point she was living with her parents and in the, in the future she would the only i mean socially expected she would have to get married to a man who would also have to protect the honor of the hijab hmm. so uh without wanting to wear it she will never ever be able to take the hijab off in public in her life again until she dies you know she she said that to me and think about it i mean when i think now about all those uh people in the west who think who think that that criticizing the hijab or calling the hijab an oppressive tool is somehow uh, Islamophobic or that protecting the hijab is somehow a feminist symbol. I just think about that and I think I don't even know who to blame because those people in the West who think that way have no idea. You know, it's it's not their fault either. And they, they think they are doing the right thing by doing that. But, you know... Uh, one more thing that is uh, frequently done when we talk about the hijab is that they pick some Muslims, some hijab wearing Muslims, and let them speak about how the, how much they love the hijab, how much they love wearing the hijab. But that is not genuine. You know, people who uh, people are forced, socially forced, in so many countries and so many places to wear the hijab. Even if they are not forced by their parents, they are socially forced outside because in the streets they they just can't appear without a hijab. Uh, but if if a, if a hijab observing Muslim woman comes out and says, "Oh, people are just Islamophobic. I really like wearing the hijab, and I do this, uh, and and this is my choice. I uh, this is what I want." They don't really mean that. Mm -hmm. What they mean is, uh, you are attacking my religion, and the hijab is uh, a symbol, a part of my religion, and therefore I will come out and do everything to defend this. That is what they mean. They don't mean they they love the hijab. And just just to make one thing clear, the hijab is obligatory in Islam. Right. Every woman has to wear the hijab. Right. Uh, in an Islamic state, it can be women can be forced to wear the hijab, and 
if a woman if a woman doesn't wear the hijab in a in a Western country in a free country in a free country, then um, she is told that she will go to hell for that and will burn for centuries for not wearing the hijab. <laughs> that, that's what oh, that's what a woman is told. Yeah. So the whole narrative of the hijab being uh, a choice and people willing to wear it is complete nonsense. People wouldn't people wouldn't wear it if it was not a religious obligation. Yeah, and and you're right. I mean, when you when you watch videos or listen to um, Islamic women speaking about their their wearing the hijab and their and they're defending themselves doing so, I mean, it does seem genuine. Um, but I mean, I guess it would be not necessarily easy to be genuine, but it would be um, it would be more difficult to you know to it, it, if if you you know if if you basically feel like a prisoner. You know, and and like you need to do this, you'd be digging your heels in, like being like coming across genuine about wanting to wear it would be easier than turning your back on the thing that will uh, that will kill you if you don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Well, I, I knew some uh, I knew someone, for example, it's, it's it's just an example that popped up in my head right now. But uh, I knew this one uh this one guy who used to be beaten by his parents every day was inside a muslim family as well but uh i, I don't want to talk about child abuse i mean about, about child abuse within islam now but i think it's a, it's a, it's an example to make uh this kid who was my age who was a friend of mine was beaten by his parents pretty much every day for piss reasons you know for for nothing for just right. being too for just being loud at home for saying a word at home for sharing his opinion about something his parents would beat the hell out of him his, he would go to school and his face would be black and blue and red and he would have to explain how he would have to make up a lie like how he was beaten outside by random people and stuff like that uh, now this person, I I know this person all my life, and I know that he has been beaten every day or every other day throughout 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 his life so far. But this person, once he uh, grew a bit older and got married to a woman and created his own family, also started completely defending his family and never admitting that his that his parents beat him. Mm -hmm. You know that his parents did that to him. I kind of compare this to uh, to women wearing the hijab and defending it. Uh, in 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 that the parents who beat them is uh, our Islam ordering the women to wear the hijab. The women have, want to stay loyal to Islam, just like this guy wants to stay loyal to his parents. And no matter how much they beat him, he will still in the end come and say, uh, my parents didn't do that to me. My parents wouldn't do such a thing. And this woman will come out and say, I'm wearing this hijab because I want it. There is nothing wrong about it. I'm not forced into it. I'm not obligated. I'm just doing this because I love it. It's about the same thing to me. And I'm sure that there are there are women in the world. There are there are Muslim women in the world that that choose to wear it and are not from families that ever required them to do it. And 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 it is a choice for them. But of course, I think that that there is an important distinction to make that that that's not really what we need to be concerned about. <laughs> of course, yes, what we yes. what we need to be concerned about is the fact that there are women that are required to wear it and that they feel as though if they don't, then terrible things are going to happen to them. And chances are they have happened to them. Of course. And the, and the bad thing is, I mean, even ignoring all of this, what we just said, what, what really is the point when a, when a, when a, when a, uh, a person in the West who has no idea about Islam, who is not familiar with Islam, thinks that, that, uh, that wearing the hijab in solidarity is a great idea. Mm -hmm. What really is the point in that? Do you really know what the hijab stands for, where it comes from, what the origins of it are? If you look at Islamic scripture, it was obviously ordered by men. Which is something that yeah. feminists who also support, uh, you know, who are who also fight the patriarchy and fight uh, men telling them what to do. Uh, it it was men who ordered women for uh, you know to wear the hijab for their own reasons. The men didn't find uh, find good ways to 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 prevent things happening to 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 women. What they did instead was to order women to wear the hijab for their own good so that they do so that they are not harassed by men yeah. so that they can hide themselves and so on and a woman has no choice a woman can't can't just drop that can't just decide oh today i'm not going to wear a hijab no a woman has to wear this her entire life how can a feminist come and defend this it's ridiculous yeah and it's it's um again being raised more on the left side of things i mean i was kind of 
surprised to find that I was disagreeing so strongly with people that that had these views about Islam and about the hijab and to find that most of those people were on the left. You know, they yeah. they thought that like by by being willing to or being or promoting respect for um really conservative brands of of Islam and promoting the the wearing of the hijab that they were being liberal in that way. Uh -huh. And I I think a lot of what it is is just not wanting to be racist which uh, which is an yeah. absurd concept because islam isn't a race first of all um so you know there you can't be racist against muslims because you know you can you can say you're islamophobic or xenophobic but it's it's you know that's that's a whole other thing but anyway the point is um that it's like in an effort to not be the people that they think are being xenophobic they themselves mm -hmm. are actually being xenophobic Absolutely. Well, I wouldn't even I mean, I would even use the the words uh, left and feminist carefully, although I, I say them quite conveniently when it comes up. Uh, I mean, I know a lot of uh, left leaning, a lot of leftist people who would be who are gladly opposed to Islam and the hijab and so on. I know a lot of feminists who think that Islam is horrible. You know, but uh, but there there are unfortunately many people who identify with both of these uh, labels, left or liberal, and feminism, who sadly have no idea what they're doing and think that somehow defending uh, Islam and uh, because of Muslims defending Islam and the hijab is somehow a great idea. But um, I don't know if if you want to allow me, I would like to address uh, something that you just said about racism. Sure, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, we have we have this thing nowadays that criticizing Islam is somehow uh, equated to racism. And uh, many people say, oh, don't say Islam is not a race. You are still a racist because you are you just hate Muslims because you just hate Muslims and Islam because they are a minority. But uh, that's not true as well. You know, <laughs> uh, in America, for example, just to give an example from America, we have uh, a lot of people from different backgrounds from uh, Hinduism. We have a lot of Hindus in America. We have a lot of Indians in America. Seriously, how many times have you seen people uh, criticizing Hinduism and Indians so so fiercely as they come out and criticize Islam? Right. I, I, ha I haven't seen any equivalent to that at all. Uh, that said, that, that said, I mean, as you, as you say, Islam is not a race. Islam is nothing near to a race. Islam is a religion, a belief, mm -hmm. something that people are born into. Sure, okay, but something that people also can change their minds on and abandon. Right. I'm a former Muslim. I used to be a Muslim as well at some point, and I decided not to be a Muslim anymore because I found it ridiculous. Uh, Equating that to racism is very unfair to people who are subject to racism because someone who is subject to racism can't do anything about that for the rest of their lives. Yeah, they have to be they have to stay in that uh, race as we falsely call it forever and be subject to hate. Therefore, a Muslim is absolutely not in the same category as cruel as it may sound. <laughs> that doesn't sound cruel. I mean, that just sounds that just sounds like reality. You know what Rational, I mean? Like, yeah. like, I mean, you know. There, there are there are Muslims who are not descendants of Middle Eastern countries. You know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you White know Muslims. you <laughs> right. I mean there there are all sorts of different Muslims. So I mean it it it's actually illogical to to say that it's racist to criticize Islam. It's it's ignorant and it's in and of itself a racist statement because you don't understand it at all. That that's my that's my uh, thing on Twitter. That's my pinned tweet on Twitter. Uh, if you think criticizing Islam is racism, you are a racist. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I mean. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of what that what um, how that started, and I mean, I'm sure there were people that thought it beforehand, but I mean, there was that that big debate on on Bill Maher's show with Ben Affleck and Sam Harris, and oh, God. you know, Ben Affleck <laughs> called Sam Harris gross and racist, and it's gross, it's racist. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, it was it was so it was really odd, and but so here's the thing, I mean, I get. I get kind of where the where the empathy is coming from because like if if there was a house down the street and I knew that in that house they were attracting people so that they could then tell them that they had to dress a certain way and if they didn't do these follow these rules then they were then they were going to kill them and that they were doing that I would have no issue saying that I denounce whatever the hell it is that they're doing over there 
Um, but the reason that we can't say that about Islam is because of the fact that people think that Muslims have it already bad enough. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I so I get where it's coming from. It's coming from a good place. But there is such a thing as radical lack of racism or something yeah, yeah, yeah. that that actually is more destructive than actually just talking about what's really going on well it's it's pretty naive i mean uh i see that too i mean i see that people are that people have a good intention when they do that when they when they try to protect uh islam or muslims without knowing anything about islam but um it is it is dangerous what people are doing. It's dangerous for two reasons, because you're being uh, completely overly tolerant of a culture, of a religion, of an identity without knowing anything about it, without uh, looking at what it is doing around the world. I would like to quote Ayan Hirsi Ali here, who is another very well-known ex-Muslim mm -hmm. who uh, liked to say tolerance of intolerance is uh, what did she say? God, I forgot the quote. <laughs> anyway, tolerance of intolerance is is, is, is is I don't know stupidity, whatever, something like that. But um, another thing is another point that I want to address uh, why it is dangerous is that there is an immense increase in the number of ex-Muslims of people who left Islam. Uh, we have the we have the group ex-Muslims of North America, for example. Yeah. Uh, that is gathering so many ex-Muslims and new ex-Muslims are joining pretty much every week. You know, so many are joining. And there are so many outside of that, outside of those groups that are also leaving their religion. According to very recent studies, uh, many people coming to America, many Muslims coming to America leave Islam because they find a new life. They are... Uh, they cut ties with their uh, with with their tribalism, with their culture that they had over there. Uh, see things differently, see life differently. Are not are not interested in living that way anymore. Mm -hmm. Doubt their religion. See how everything is so much better without it, and leave Islam. Now, with this in, with this immense increase of ex-Muslims, I really wonder how these naively tolerant. Uh, left-leaning liberal people will act in the future when things turn around and when ex-Muslims need their help. Uh, this is a very common topic among, among ex-Muslims because uh, many ex-Muslims are left-leaning, you know, in their political views, in their worldview. And uh, many even leave Islam because of that, because they think that way and because they have a moral problem with Islam. But when they come to the West and see that like-minded people, otherwise like-minded people, think that ex-Muslims somehow are, uh, you know, obnoxious or racist or Islamophobic or whatever, when they see left-leaning people defend Islam and Muslims and so on, what they usually, what ex-Muslims usually say is that we are being betrayed mm -hmm. by those who are otherwise supposed to stand up for us because we are being persecuted in 13 Islamic countries. We are being persecuted in many more Islamic countries illegally. Uh, in many more Islamic countries, there are just so many restrictions against us that are, you know, that completely disable our lives so that ex-Muslims have to find refuge in different countries like in America or, or in uh, European countries. Uh, aren't these tolerant, aren't these left-leaning people supposed to stay with us now? Aren't they supposed to help us? What is, uh, what's our fault in leaving Islam? What's our fault in not believing this religion, in, in, this, in this religion anymore, in criticizing it, in talking against it because it's so inhumane? Uh, and what will these people, what will these left-leaning people do when we need their help in the future? When things turn around, will they suddenly change their mind and think, "Oh, okay, we should support we should support these ex-Muslims now and uh, put a few regulations on Islam and uh, also be Islamophobic, just like uh, the conservatives before us"? Is that what's supposed to happen? Right, <laughs> right. It's, and it's tricky. And I think what a lot of people will do to avoid criticizing Islam is like they'll they'll think that maybe the next best thing to still show solidarity for ex-Muslims would be to maybe criticize the countries themselves. Maybe say yeah. that, like, you know, it's not Islam, it's Iran or it's Saudi Arabia, um, when, you know, the ex-Muslims themselves will be able to tell you, you know, it's like, yes, those countries have problematic theocracies, but we need to address the fact that, the, that a theocracy is based on something that is objectively using mm -hmm. the words correctly to do what it's doing they're not misinterpreting mm -hmm. it they're they're just 
taking it fundamentally, literally, and using it against me. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, interesting point. I mean, uh, there was this thing recently about uh, this girl called Rahaf. It was all over the news. You might have uh, seen it or heard of it. I've been following who, it, yeah. Yeah, who fled from Saudi Arabia. And she was an ex-Muslim. You know, yeah. She left Islam. She had problems there for. Uh, she wanted to be free. She wanted to live her life. Fled from that country. Very interestingly, very ironically, we have seen many people who otherwise uh, oppose our... Uh, our, our premise, our work, suddenly come out and be completely in support of that woman, and uh, you know, atta verbally attacking, ideologically attacking Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. uh, vilifying Saudi Arabia, and helping Rahaf and seeing it as a humanitarian thing to help the to help that girl. I have been, to be very fair, I haven't even spoken about it very much, but I have been very hesitating in talking about the whole Rahaf issue because. Uh, she had her help, you know, people helped her. Yasmin Mohammed, for example, did a great job helping her. Mm -hmm. uh, shout out to her, by the way, she's amazing. Um, but uh, the thing is, this is something those people did because it was Saudi Arabia, not because it was Islam. It's something that people did because because it was Saudi Arabia, not because it was an ex-Muslim woman being persecuted by her uh, by her Muslim by her strict Muslim family. Because things like Rahaf's case happen every day; they happen all the time. Yeah. We have stories of hundreds of thousands of people who experience the same thing and who run away from their families, ex-Muslims who separate from their families and are afraid, uh, and are in secret they are they live in shelters they are protected by ex-muslim organizations don't know what to do with their life anymore become suicidal and 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 uh other ex-muslims support them and try to try to help them try to keep them uh you know happy and try to uh try to help them acquire a new life this happens every day uh but somehow the left-leaning people who are otherwise oppose our work and think we are just uh, talking a lot of nonsense, suddenly get loud when it comes to Saudi Arabia. Hmm. Or they, they would suddenly be loud if it came to, to Iran, for example. But that's that's not how it's supposed to be. That's It's 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 good in a way, but it's also counterproductive in a, in a different way. We need to talk about the real problem here. We need to talk about, talk about Islam, talk about Islamist sentiments in our countries, in the West. As ex-Muslims, we see that uh, that many Muslims, that many religious fundamentalist Muslims and other Muslims demand every day that our voices, you know, the voices of ex-Muslims be silenced because they are kind of they, they are somehow offended by our testimonies of why we left Islam. Right. And as long as uh, as long as left leaning people who would rather tolerate Islam uh, don't recognize us and uh, keep protecting Islam, we will have a problem there. This concludes part one. In the next episode, Apostate Prophet and I continue our discussion about misinterpretations of Islam in the West, and we get into politics a little bit. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe and leave a five-star review. Most importantly, share the show with someone you trust.